Thank you all for coming. We're starting with a nice, a nice intimate group, so I really appreciate you coming. People will come and go, so feel free to come and go as you like through the day, but please stay as long as you'd like, because we have a big, big show today. That's part of our Big Talk Symposium, which celebrates all that we've been doing all this year. And I can tell you what that is. So we do welcome you to Big Talk. We have our first panel assembling on the stage, which we'll get to very shortly. But the few things I want to uh, tell you. First off, my name is Mark Heflin. I'm the director of American Illustration, American Photography, and I do welcome you today. To Big Talk. And as I said, we're celebrating American photography. And maybe you saw a little quick peek of the new book outside, but this is it for all the world to see for the first time. And we're celebrating American illustration and the new book. And the celebration continues tomorrow night at the party, so I hope you're all coming for that as well. But first, a few thank yous. First to SVA, who have yet again, for, for another year, let us in and provided the space for our Big Talk Symposium. So we're very grateful, and uh, we thank SVA for all of their help putting this program together. And we thank Epson, who sponsors our Latin American show, which we'll get into a bit more later. But they uh, produced the exhibit, which will be uh, up tomorrow night at the party. And we'll be uh, presenting our Los Diaz winners today, which we'll get to shortly. And I want to mention all of our newsletters, which probably arrive in your email inboxes every day, multiple times a day. So we thank you for reading those. You probably get Dart by Peggy Rolfe. Pro Photo Daily by David Schonauer, who's up on the stage. Motion Arts Pro by David Schonauer. Dispatches from Latin America by David Schonauer. And our new one, which we're really excited about, Profiles for Photographers and Illustrators. Uh, also by David Schonauer and Robert Newman share the uh, editing duties for that publication. So we hope you enjoy those. Back to Big Talk. And our first panel. Photographers as Advocates, a new way to change the world. I'm going to pass it over to David, who's on your left side. I'll let him make introductions, and they'll have at it. And then I will be stepping up here if they go a little over to kind of close things out. But we do want questions from you. So think about what you want to ask these guys, and we'll, make, we'll certainly make time for questions. So David, it's all okay. yours. OK, thanks, Mark. Um, when we started this panel, uh, it was going to be about one thing, it, and then it flipped and became about something else. Um, we were going to talk about how photographers are using a new online storytelling sites to get their pictures out. And after I talked to these two fellows uh, for a while and we started discussing what we were going to talk about, um, it became apparent that what we were really focusing on was how photographers are using new tools not to just to get their pictures seen, but to make an impact with their pictures. And that means, you know, really using them to make um, meaningful change, uh, social change, even policy change, uh, which um, is, um, I think, is a pretty important aspect of uh, most photographers' lives now. Um, Certainly photojournalists and documentary photographers, 
but also um, um, a lot of other photographers who are doing personal projects which are close to their hearts. Um, so, as I was saying, these two fellows have, have been have been working in this area and have something to uh, offer about it. So I'm going to introduce them. Uh, Doug Menue is a photographer and director who has shot for Time, Life, Newsweek, Fortune, USA Today, The New York Times Magazine, and a lot of other publications. Uh, he's also created advertising campaigns for Chevrolet, Nikon, GE, Chevron, HP, Emirates, Airlines, and Microsoft. He's published four books, including Fearless Genius, The Digital Revolution in Silicon Valley, 1985 to 2000. Uh, that book was the result of a 15-year personal project in which Doug documented the people who really innovated the world we're living in today. Uh, the work has been called an indispensable account of an important piece of American history. Tim Matsui is a multimedia journalist from Seattle. Last year, he released a feature-length documentary called The Long Night, which looks at uh, the sex trafficking of minors in Seattle by focusing on the stories of a number of people, including teenage girls, their parents, and police. Uh, this year, Tim won the top prize for long features from World Press Photo and the Documentary of the Year Prize from Pictures of the Year International. And I should mention that you can read about both Tim and Doug in our weekly profiles. And that Tim is going to be taking part in an all-day se uh, seminar on Friday uh, at ICP that's sponsored by the Alexia Foundation, which is around the same topic, photography as an agent of change. So Tim, why don't we start with you and, and, and tell us a little bit about, for people who might not be aware of The Long Night, you know, about the about the film and how you came to make it. Okay, thank you. Um, so the long night uh, started as as leaving the life. This overall project looking at domestic minor sex trafficking, and in two thousand nine, when I came back from uh, a trip to Southeast Asia where I was documenting trafficking for labor and sex, I saw that the city of Seattle was uh, addressing this issue of of minors involved in commercial sex uh, in ways that I'd seen abroad. So I thought maybe I could do some stories in my own backyard around it and spent the next four years writing grants and doing researching um, and reestablishing connections that I had within the community. Uh, and then in 2012, I won the Alexia Foundation's uh, inaugural women's initiative grant. And that allowed me, or it was seed capital basically for a photography project that turned into a film because of the access and the relationships and the fact that I was shooting a lot of video and now I'm working on what I guess in film terms is called the impact campaign, mm -hmm. uh, which is trying to take that content and getting it out to audiences where they are so they can use that as a tool for advocacy or awareness or education, et cetera. So. Like what kind of audiences? Um. Uh, it, well, government, law enforcement, prosecution, uh, victim services, uh, faith-based groups, um, educators and school systems, community groups. I mean, it, it, it's a niche audience, but it spans the spectrum of America. So there's an audience in every community and in every business and in every government or organization. Right. Uh, you were telling me about... Um, uh, Tim's got a really good... Uh, essay you should read on Medium um, about he won both of these big awards, but he's saying it's, it wasn't really the point uh, of why he was doing this. And um, you were telling me that, that one of those awards kind of led to um, uh, like an engagement in Kansas City uh, where you were able to bring the FBI actually together with a, a community. We're, we're talking. You're talking about it. <laughs> their their uh, communications person in Kansas City is talking with their special agent who does the, it's the CETF, which I forget, commercial exploitation, uh, trafficking, I don't know. Anyway, mm -hmm. they changed the acronym. Um, but yeah, so because I have relationships in law enforcement in the Seattle area and there's this network across the country, I can call up people and say, I'm going to be in such and such a place um, who would you recommend be on this, this panel discussion that I'm going to moderate after the film or, or something along those lines? And it was Pictures of the Year that was approached by uh, Kansas City Public Library 
to do a series of screenings of their award-winning work, and they're, they're going to do a, a, a night devoted to the long night. Nice. Yeah. And then also in neighboring Snohomish County, I live in King County, and Seattle is, you know, the, in the middle of it. And to the north is the Snow Isle County, and their library system uh, has an Issues That Matter forum, and so they asked me to moderate a, a similar panel there. And then we're going to get the film into general circulation as well as do a series of screenings at their branch libraries. So that's something that libraries around the country can do. Um, and I'm going to propose that to Kansas City as well. Neat. Um, and since I also work on the motion panel, I was kind of interested um, to find out a little bit about how you, this was your first film. And it's an incredibly great you know, feature length documentary. Um, how did, how did you manage to pull that together and, and transition to film? By the seat of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of mistakes. Uh, by getting told at the beginning that I need to learn how to shoot film. Um, Tim McLaughlin was reviewing some of my footage, and he's like, dude, you got to hold the shot. You know? Um, yeah, exactly, the 10-second rule. I will literally count off 10 seconds now. Um, but I've been doing, since I guess, since I started, I mean, in the 90s, whatever, I've, I've always wanted to have audio as a component or a series of images. I've never been the newspaper or the wire service shooter that's got that one frame that captures everything. Mm -hmm. I, I've always wanted more to tell a, a deeper story. And I think that in that respect, um, film sort of suits my, my preference. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted audio for this piece, so I just kind of walked into this, this photography project with the idea that I wanted to have some rich, you know, motion, and so uh, I started shooting that, and I realized very quickly that that needed to be the priority. You know, the first night I went out with the, the cops, I shot only stills, and the next time I went out, I barely shot any stills and focused on motion, and that requires, you know, a changing of, of, of gear. Um, that said, I operated as a, mostly as a one-man band. I had, yeah. And as a multimedia journalist, you were probably already working with audio um, a lot, so you had that experience. Um, were your goals, I mean, did you have a clear set of goals when you started the project in terms of this after the impact part of this project, or? I, I didn't know what I could do impact-wise, but I've, and I think this is, I write this in, in that piece in Vantage, um, is that, I don't want to just tell a story and and feel good about it, get it published, you know, have some accolades, whatever. I just, I don't, that's not the point. Like, I'm building this relationship with my subjects to help them tell their story. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, I come to from doing a lot of work around sexual violence. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started working around trauma and victimization. Um, and I was talking about it with my friends, and a number of them came forward and disclosed about sexual assault or rape. And I think my way of coping with the secondary trauma was to help them tell their stories in a way that would educate the community so that the community would be more receptive to survivors wanting to come forward. Because uh, I asked the, the, the dumb questions. You know, I was, I was in that well, boat of, well, why didn't you do X? You know, um, And I realized that that's inappropriate and not supportive, and I wanted others to understand what that meant. Um, so since then, every personal project has had something of that nature embedded within it. So mm -hmm. I didn't really realize what this, this film could lead to, but I think I started the project knowing that that's where I wanted to go in some capacity. And um, yeah, I didn't even know about Harvest before that. And Harvest is the... Um, so Andrew Devigal, who was at the New York Times, helped create uh, Snowfall, um, right, right. right? So that you know, kind of the launch of uh, Parallax web design for editorial. Um, he and his wife Laura, uh, they have a mobile app that allows us to capture an audience's emotional reactions in real time. So if we can go to policymakers and experts and say, let's get you in the room. We know you have trouble talking about this issue, but we're going to show you some content that's documentary, or I should say journalistic, um, and it will definitely you know, trigger you. 
and we're going to capture your reactions, and then we're going to use those differences in, in your opinions and your emotional reactions as a starting point for facilitated discussion with the purpose that we're going to co-create solutions, and you're going to walk out of here individually and organizationally with a call to action. Wow. That's so that's what we're working on. But I mean, that, that didn't even exist when I started. Yeah, so. that's pretty neat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people need that. So, Doug, <laughs> why don't you why don't you tell us uh, about um, and this Doug's project on the Silicon Valley is it's it's an epic saga, <laughs> but uh, why don't you tell us how it came about and and how it developed? It's epically killing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I was a young photojournalist. I was um, a news photographer, and I was covering all kinds of stuff, and I ended up covering the famine in Ethiopia and conflict in Eritrea for Newsweek, and um, it was, even though I had seen a lot of death and a lot of stuff going on in my career at that point, my young career, walking into a camp with 100,000 people and almost all of them are near death was different. And the scale of this suffering was just, and you know, I think like all photojournalists, I wanted to bring light to injustice or change the world. I was willing to die for a photo that could do that, but I felt completely useless and I wasn't really figuring out how to contribute. You know, I was shooting and shooting and trying to make strong pictures, but um, when I got back, I kind of had a early midlife crisis mm -hmm. and I had a little bit of an epiphany that I wanted to find stories that were um, more hopeful and more positive for the human race because you start to think about, you know, Tolstoy's man's inhumanity to man and I had shot crack houses and I shot, well, uh, drug dealers, and I later shot crack houses, but I, was d I did the AIDS crisis before it was called AIDS, and i just seen a lot of tough stuff. This really made me think, what is the point of living, you know? But when I, that same year, when I got back to the Bay Area where I was living then, Steve Jobs was fired from Apple, but he announced he was going to build a supercomputer to transform education, and that got my attention because I knew uh, all the shot i have been shooting for probably by that point, you know, I started shooting for newspapers in 76 or even earlier. Um, and I went to the Washington Post before I started magazines. Mm -hmm. But um, in every story that I'd ever done, it just seemed like education was the underlying thing behind all social issues. And if you could attack education with a guy like Steve Jobs, who'd already changed the world, anyway, I thought, that's my story. So I, I approached Steve through friends and I convinced him to let me document him building the next computer for three years. And then Life Magazine gave me an assignment to do it. So that's how it started and I ended up, because Steve trusted me, I spent three years with him. But then after that ended, I went out into the valley. I became obsessed with this hidden tribe because clearly they were building tools that would transform everything about our lives including our behavior, our culture, the nature of work changed. I was there at Adobe for four years while they were figuring out Photoshop, so my industry changed. Which uh, I love because you were shooting it in Triax. In Triax, so at 1600 or 800, right? So anyway, I shot this thing for 15 years and it was a noble cause and then it turned corrupt because it was so successful and there was so much money and it ended up in this huge crash in 2000 uh, that was unsustainable. So gold, the gold rush for IPOs, and then I, it became not interesting to me. I put the stuff in boxes, and I walked away from the story. Did, did, did Life publish this, the, the story that you no. originally intended? No, it was never published. Actually, by the time the, ne the idea was to shoot this product from launch, from beginning inception to launch, and I wanted to understand Steve's process of innovation. I had studied visual anthropology, and I was using some of the precepts of that to understand the culture and who these people were. And they were developing a new culture and a new language, mm -hmm. along with the new technology at the time. It all seems very cliche now. Um, but by the time they got to the launch, Life Magazine had gone way downhill, and Steve only wanted the cool shit. And he decided he didn't want the story to run, and he convinced Life to kill the story. I had a cover and eight pages laid out. And I had a huge fight with Steve, but anyway, he won that one. I won a later fight. but. Um, I, I kind of became, I let go of it. And I, I, because he had given me this incredible gift of trust, all the doors opened. I was able to go behind the scenes with every major innovator over the 15 years. So I've created this archive of 250,000 images that Stanford University Library then acquired and has been preserving. And that's why we were able to bring out this book, which is, it came out a year ago and it's still for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and we've created a nonprofit foundation, so you should definitely buy it. <laughs> 
is we're, we're bringing these stories um, of struggle and conflict and innovation, how you create stuff, um, to young entrepreneurs around the world. Yeah, tell us about some of your plans for this. Um, I, well, the book is the first tangible ed evidence, but part of this is try how, do you, how do you survive as a photographer? And then how do you create social change and how do you have an impact with the work? And, um, and I don't know, I don't know anything. But, <laughs> but if, you could, if you have your core photo essay and you add audio and video and you could create a web series and a, and a film and you could then create exhibitions and then the idea that we have is to do all of that and we're doing it step by step but then to take that content which I'm donating to this nonprofit foundation and now what we're doing that's so exciting is we're creating education programs for entrepreneurs. So for example, a professor from MIT, um, in, they have an MBA program in Lisbon and they are um, we taught our first segment on being an entrepreneur at this program a month ago, and it was a huge success. We're developing this curriculum into a seven-part series that kind of matches the arc of the, the narrative of the film we're doing. I've done five interviews so far oh, for the I, film. I missed the part about the film. Well, I've been bootstrapping all this. So we've had different deals fall apart. I haven't done a Kickstarter yet. I've been supporting this with our savings, which never do that. So it's, it's been really hard because we've gotten really close to the brass ring on distribution deals and stuff, but I've walked away from several because they weren't... I want to retain control as a naive artist. <laughs> and I just, I'm just not going to take any deal. So we have a team of people now helping us build the foundation. We've assembled a board of directors with John Scully is on my board and Louis Rosetto, the founder of I Wired write. Magazine. <laughs> yeah. And there's a really cool Ivy Ross who runs Google Glass is on our board, and we're really going to do some interesting stuff. now. What is the impact of this? Well, we had a conference call yesterday with a very cool guy, a billionaire in Africa, who has funded a 1,000 young entrepreneurs in Africa. So we're going to go back to Africa to shoot what's happening there because, yes, there's a lot of horror, but there's an incredible positive story of change happening at the, gra at the grassroots level that I'm very interested in. So, no, I didn't change the world in my pictures, but I got to shoot the people who did, yeah. and telling their stories has become my mission now. So what we've been doing for the last two years is the exhibit has been traveling from Russia to Visa Pour Limage to China. It's been to China three times. It's going to, the next exhibit is at this museum in, in South Korea, opens on the 29th. We were just at the Nordlich Festival in Holland. As boring as technology seems, for some reason around the world, people think this is very interesting, and it's particularly interesting to entrepreneurs who are trying to figure out how to build companies that can have positive impact, in other words, social entrepreneurs. Yeah. They want to create products that help the world and they'll make a profit at the same time. Yeah. And you have to have that. So there's, um, so the plan now is to build out the education program and reach these entrepreneurs. And I was giving this talk, and part of the thing is I kind of found this path by giving this talk, being invited to give the talk, right? And I was speaking at uh, the Dent the Future conference, I've done a few TEDx's and those kinds of things. And this reporter from the Seattle Times came up to me after the talk and said, you know, this guy sitting next to me, he burst into tears listening to you, and he said, I have to go home and quit my job now and start my life. And he ran out of the room, and he packed his bags, and he flew home. Well, I would call that impact. And he's <laughs> starting a company, and he's doing really well. So I'm like, I don't want that responsibility. But, <laughs> but, you know, good news, we're all entrepreneurs. You want to be a photographer? Wake up and smell the business plan, okay? There's no art without commerce. Everyone has to take responsibility for this. You have to learn how to run your business. You want to do a film, you want to do a book, there's a budget. And this is part of what being an entrepreneur is about. It's like, how do you raise the money? What is your dream? Okay, set that all aside. The lessons that I learned in Silicon Valley is really about what is worth doing with your life. What is your mission? So the people I photographed in the early days, they really were dreamers and idealistic. Steve Jobs really believed in trying to improve the world. He really did. Forget the movie you just saw, because it's all wrong, <laughs> and it's it a did. lie. <laughs> but he was a lunatic, trust me, and I'm not excusing bad behavior, but Steve really did believe in that. They were willing to sacrifice everything, and people died that I photographed trying to invent shit. Okay, so it was serious as the sun. Now young entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley cannot get support to go after big ideas, to dream big about really important stuff. They can get enough money to do an app or a game. But if they want to do hard science or healthcare, it's just not there. The funding's not there because the culture has permanently kind of locked down since the collapse in this fear-based culture. But where it is really happening in exciting long-term ways is India, 
Brazil, part of Russia, China, Africa. So those entrepreneurs that are reaching for the stars, I want to encourage them to go big, to think big, and go for the the most important things that really could change the world in important ways. Yeah. And they're and it's happening, and they're out there. So that's that's my thing now is to try and get this content to fuel that a new revolution of young technologists doing meaningful stuff that's you know going to help humanity. Yeah. Well, let me ask you both because one of the things I've interviewed you both for the for the profiles and uh, and a couple of other people too. And this issue seems to be or this question seems to be coming up at least for me whenever I do this um, is the nature of photojournalism, documentary photography changing in that um, the idea was you could make an impact as a photojournalist by exposing something, bringing something to light, raising people's awareness of something, of an issue, and then that would, that would make a difference. I'm seeing a lot of photographers now working for, with foundations, setting up foundations, um, you know, doing community outreach. Uh, it's, it's, it's an advocacy role. I think that's what we wanted to do. When I was a young newspaper photographer, your dream is to have an impact to try to create some kind of dialogue around what you've seen because it's so horrific or whatever. But how do you turn that into you know, any kind of social change? And I think what Tim is like an incredible example of how you do that. Yeah. I mean, on a really practical level, and I'm going to go study Tim. <laughs> I'm going to study you. <laughs> <laughs> because, no, but this is really hard shit. It's really hard to go out there. Every once in a while, a picture will surface, and it goes viral, and people think about it for five minutes. You know what? It wins an award. Da, da, da. And I went back to Ethiopia, and they still had the same famine 10 years later. Okay, So the stuff keeps repeating. Human behavior, whoever doesn't study the past is doomed to repeat it. Was that Churchill or something? Anyway, if you can create programs that have an impact. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big deal. I think the point is to start small in communities and work your way out and start building relationships within communities. You know, so part of what I saw in Silicon Valley was a huge lack of diversity. But what I noticed, I was in the meetings while they were inventing this stuff, and they, and at Apple, for example, they started hiring women engineers and people of color. And those people got around the table when they would have like a product marketing meeting. And they'd be battling between the engineers and the marketing people what features to put in the product. And what I learned was whoever writes the code controls the machine, which controls your behavior and the wider culture. So diversity fucking matters. Yeah. Because the worldview matters of the person writing the code, and therefore the feature set will change. So that's one of the things we're trying to do with the foundation is reach diverse young people to get them into math and science and coding, which is, there's a lot of that going on already, but the stories that I have explain how this was done back in the day and how the lessons from that are relevant for today. Right. I, I think something important to note um, in this way in which photographers are becoming more active in the issue itself is that we have publishing tools now that we didn't have prior to. We had to get our work published by somebody in one of these editorial silos which I think are still incredibly relevant and, and valuable um, in, in what they stand for. Um, but we can also step aside and do something for an audience that, that exists that wouldn't normally go to that silo or that we may know through having done the reporting. I mean, we become experts on the issues that we're reporting on, and we know all the, the points of, of connection. So why not get A to connect with B and say, here's this content, go play with it. You know, make something with that. I just am helping tell that story. And we can do that on something like, like Medium, you know. Um, I published that essay basically to say, this is my transparency. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm an activist or an advocacy person, um, especially since I have to walk a very fine political line on the issue around prostitution. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that I can get that content into the hands of people who can do something with it, and I can do that through a variety of, of tools that didn't exist even five years ago. But by using those tools and organizing yourself, you become an advocate for change by putting the power of your stories into the hands of people that can, on the ground, make changes. Yes, an advocate for change, but not necessarily an advocate for... Does, uh, yeah, you know, 
I mean, dealing with sex work, for instance, versus prostitution, or decriminalization versus legalization versus abolitionism. I mean, this is this, it's, it's a really messy thing. And I've only told half the story at this point. Yeah. But to tell the second half of the story, I might piss off the people from the first half of the story. And I've been struggling, <laughs> you know, to prove myself to Would the second half. The second half be more solution oriented or? No, well, I mean, if you look at, at sex work on a spectrum, um, I mean, what I have is a, a victim, a survivor, and law enforcement. What I don't have is a pimp, a buyer, or a consensual sex worker. And there are some people who would say there is no such thing as consensual sex work, but there are people who do say that there is. And I think that as a good journalist, we need to provide the opportunity for all those voices to come to the table. Because if we're going to make policy decisions, we can't be doing it by, you know, having a little sound off with the choir or something like that. We got to get everybody that diversity in the room so we can make real decisions that are going to have hopefully a positive impact. Yeah, and I think it's go back to when you were talking about when you were young and the stuff that you were doing, you know, at a certain level, all journalism is a kind of advocacy, even though it's it might be just putting a magazine to sell copies and, and whatnot. You're going to piss somebody off because you're you're telling a story, and most of the times people don't want that story out. Yeah. So, well, um, what else? What else should we talk about? Well, those are... Well, I would just also add that the technology that we're using, these storytelling sites, I think have tremendous um, advantages for young photographers to be able to get their work out there. Yeah. Although you still have to make a living, it's kind of like the business model that Instagram and all these companies followed was get a following, and mm -hmm. then you can monetize it. Mm -hmm. So I think we all have to follow that, wh whoever's out there, and that's really important. And by the way, all this technology that we use today, every product, Everything that exists in the world that anyone uses from the space station to the hospital, whatever, was invented during the 80s and 90s by the people that I photographed, or the 70s it's before amazing. that. It's amazing. And therefore, who, what, what does that mean? It means we're kind of in a, in a lull right now. China graduated 2 million engineers last year. The United States, 150,000. So we're kind of screwed, and Silicon Valley doesn't want to hear this because they think they're really innovative and really successful. There hasn't been a single innovation in America since I ended my project in 2000, not one, that has scaled up to create millions of jobs here in the US. These guys created more jobs and wealth than any time in human history, and by the time the 2000 was done, it was all offshore, yeah. which is great because it helped the whole world scale up. But what about the, uh, the US economy? How will that continue to grow? Unless we solve the education piece and get people engineers, it, it just won't. Tim, what, um, suppose there's somebody who's got an idea, who's got an issue that's very close to their hearts, and they want to do something about it, and they've created some work about it. What would you tell them to do now? What would, what would be the next step? Partnership, um, because I mean, if you have a body of work, it may not be refined. The story may be a little iffy in there. You may not be able to get an editor's eyes on it. You may not be able to get that big publication to get it out there that one time. But your audience is the people that you've been reporting on or those associated with them. I mean, I love this whole, you know, push back to education and science, you know, STEM education, for instance. We, we need that. And add A for the arts, because that's the next phase. Mm. Okay. STEAM. STEAM. All righty. I, I like that. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it, whoever you're reporting on, um, or like when I, I do a, a screening and I talk to the audience, you know, people say, well, what can I do? Well, do you work for a business? What is that business's policies around this issue? You know, what do you, do you, do you have children? Are you involved in their education? You know, are you on the PTA? How can you get support for after school programs? Things like that. It's like be creative, step out a little bit further and, and see where that content or that story can marry with uh, a, an entity or a group or an individual. It's not that you have to get a movie in a theater. Is you have to get the content to people who are embedded in the issue itself. I would just step even further back and think about planning. So shoot, I would, first of all, hopefully you're shooting and getting into the story and you have some work to show, but then you gotta write a business plan. You really do, you have to think, how are you gonna fund this? Like I bootstrapped this because I decided to do advertising to pay for my personal documentary work. And that worked out, but 
now I'm using my savings and that's bad. <laughs> this is not that much advertising work out there. So what could you do? You can do what Tim did. He said he spent four years writing grant proposals. That's, the, okay, so there's all these funding sources out there. There's, there are foundation grants available. You could do a Kickstarter. You could do even uh, go to a bank and get an SBA loan. They, they're doing $35,000 loans for starting photographers now or for sm small businesses up to $100,000. I got an SBA loan for 100 grand in 1993 when I did my first book <laughs> because somebody told me about it. I wrote a business plan in 93 and I got that money. So there's all kinds of ways to get money, but you gotta have a budget and you gotta think about what are you gonna do with this story altogether. Think about it now, think about the audio now. Think about the video, take Brian Storm's workshop at MediaStorm. <laughs> That's another really important thing, is educate yourself on how to be a great storyteller if you're not already versed in that. Yeah. Make a plan. And then the distribution plan comes later. Yeah, it's funny because... Uh, it's it, really easy. So much of what you were just saying is just exactly what I hear when, I, when I'm doing research for the motion panel um, or for the motion newsletter. Uh, it's the same themes that come up about, you know, getting your your film project off the ground it's what you just said it's you know starting with you know basically have your shit together <laughs> yeah you have to you have to be prepared there's so many people and there's so much competition the distribution part i mentioned at the end you could come later but actually that could be at the very beginning if you have strong body of work already you might go and get some funding via a distribution partner mm -hmm. um anyway there's corporate sponsorships too i forgot to mention that's one of the most important these are the new medicis you know, in Europe and in Canada, this is much more, and in Brazil in particular, there's a tax benefit for companies that support the arts. Not so much here, but there are a lot of companies out there that do support this kind of stuff, especially uh, a lot of the new, um, I call them graduates, people who've cashed out of Facebook and other things. They are very interested in social change. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, as long as you have a topic that um, doesn't have a lot of triggers in it, I have yet to find any corporation like camera manufacturers or anything in our industry that are willing to touch the issue. Um, you have a good point. You chose a subject that's really, and my subject, I couldn't get arrested because it was so, wow, it's Silicon Valley, so boring, you know. So until people see how it affects their own lives, it's not necessarily relevant. But I really like people that do esoteric hard stories. Thank you, Tim, for doing that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I still haven't paid back my savings. <laughs> did, um, <laughs> Doug, did, uh, was there a turning point? Did Steve Jobs' death um, focus any attention on what you had done or, or, or anything like that? It was hard because a lot of my friends and people were watching to see if I was going to exploit Steve's death. And I pushed the publication date a year because I didn't want to, you know, I have sources and I have people still that I need to interview and photograph, so I am walking a fine line in the valley, and I have, um, I've kind of pissed off a lot of people by making this statement like I just said to you guys about innovation, because it is very innovative right now, but they're all iterations. But Steve um, sent a message before he died of support that meant the world to me. Yeah. Even though I hadn't seen him since 94, I kind of cut him <laughs> off. <laughs> but he knew what I was doing, and he was for it. And he, that has been the most important thing to keep me going. Because one thing about Steve was that he never gave up. And he was willing to fail all the way, and he burned through his whole savings before he became a billionaire. He was almost br completely broke. And so I kind of hear his voice, because he said to me, when we had this argument about Life Magazine, he goes, <laughs> Don't worry about it, Doug. You'll have fun with these pictures someday. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks away. <laughs> so I definitely think um, his death helped me find a way forward and keep pushing the project. And, mm. Well, let's turn it out and see if anybody's got any questions for um, Tim and Doug. Any, any, any projects you want to talk about or any questions? Well, I think it's all about great storytelling, and these new tools can make really, and, and it depends on the technology you're looking at the story on. So this is all kind of organically improving your interaction with the story in that case. But Tim was, I think, mentioned Snowfall, but I mean, that was a really huge deal when that came out. And I mentioned Brian Storm because he likes to use all these new storytelling techniques in his 
work that he does. If you don't know MediaStorm, just check it out because there's some amazing stories on there. And he uses all of that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm not one for gimmicks and gadgets and stuff. I just really believe in the purest, simplest thing. But I would definitely use cool shit like that if it is in the service of the story. You know what I mean? If it's not, like, I don't even like wide angle lenses because it's a subconscious filter that the viewer sees that's not what their eye sees. So it's already taking them away from the reality, although I do use them, I'm just saying. You have to really think carefully about what tools you use and whether it's going to get in the way of your story or help tell it. Yeah. Um, I, social media, um, you know, if you can get somebody to pause for a moment, laugh or look or pay attention to the story and then share it with their friends, um, then I think it's worthwhile. Again, I think it's building an audience and then you can monetize that audience through a Kickstarter later if you want. Um, or you might find connections with uh, individuals or organizations that want to license the work or do something greater with it or um, get involved in some way. I mean, it's, it's kind of a new way of fishing, I guess. And you get to do cool stuff with these tools. But it does all come back to story or cats. Social media. That's it. Uh, an application for crowd reaction is called Harvis, H-A-R-V-I-S, and the company that's uh, doing that is a fourthact.com, and uh, you spell out F-O-U-R-T-H, a fourthact.com, and really that's just that's Andrew Devigal and his wife Laura Laforti, and um, they've created this thing, um, and I'm one of their partners. I got a fledgling fund grant to partner with them to bring that software into the storytelling that I have so that I can then use it with policymakers and experts. Um, did you want more details on it or no? Okay. Also, if you go to uh, leavingthelife.com, and that's leaving-the-life.com, um, there's an example of one of the data sets that we did. We did a, a test run in a theater in Seattle area with a bunch of law enforcement, prosecution, victim services, uh, educators, et cetera. And um, you can see how they responded to it. And you can listen to my lovely voiceover, <laughs> which maybe I'll change one day. But it, it's kind of an example of how it works there, too. I went to art school before I wanted to be an artist. And then I met a photojournalist in a commune where I was living in San Francisco. And he took me down to the examiner and made me a photojournalist. Um, and then after a number of years doing that, I decided I really wanted to go long form and do my own stories, and I tried to figure out how to pay for that. And that's one of the things that I learned in Silicon Valley. I actually watched Steve Jobs create a business plan, beg for money, raise money, and build a business. So I was like, hey. And I learned from that, and I went home, and I built a studio, and I ended up with 15 employees in Sausalito. That wasn't my true path, but I learned how to do the business side. So. I teach these workshops now where the first half is ripping apart your portfolio and trying to try to find your true voice, what you're most passionate about, because you're never going to hit it out of the park if you don't go for what you really, really love, what turns you on every day. But you've got to support that with the business side. You can't just wander around, hope the money falls off trees, or you get a job somewhere, or marry well, or whatever. It's just logical. You have to learn this shit. I didn't want to learn it. I'm, I can barely add two and two. But they don't teach it in art school. They don't teach it in photography school. They're starting to tweak on it. I kind of think maybe it's not their job to teach that. And I, I was really down on schools for not providing that because I, it was so important in my own life and success later to have to go through that horror of learning business. <laughs> That's not what I wanted. But without being, if you're not born rich, you know, you have to learn it. If you want to have money, money's a tool. I didn't understand that until later in life. But I think that there should be some other place where people can go and learn these business skills. They should be an awareness that they need to learn them. And when I've done these workshops over the years, everywhere from Santa Fe to w Woodstock, and people really kind of have a chip on their shoulder, like it's not their thing that they should have to do, but they're there begrudgingly. And by the end of the class, they're usually in tears because they have to really deal with it. So it's everybody's thing. Either you've got parents that are going to bankroll your dream, or you've married well, and hopefully they're not only wealthy, but they're an accountant. 
or you just learn this shit. It's really fucking hard. Sorry, but you have to learn it. Get it up, bookkeeping book. But yeah, good question. We don't have time to answer this question. That, that, that's a, that is a very good question. Tim, go. Tim, go ahead. I called my folks on the way to the airport last night for the red eye and just caught up with them briefly. Uh, I'm here in New York this week, and next week I'm in Atlanta. Uh, and the week after that, I'm going to go to the Banff area and go ice climbing. And that's my way of like reconnecting with friends and f centering myself. So I've learned a bit to make that time. Um, when you in involve family, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, I kind of think kids should be first. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's something you got to figure out kind of like the business thing um, and, and realize that you, you got to make time and you got to balance it out, but there's also times when you can just sink yourself in it completely and disappear, and, and that can be okay too. It's really hard because it's hard to succeed at anything without giving 100 million percent to it, right? And I think photojournalists, when I got to the Washington Post, 21 photographers, 20 had been divorced and one was separated and getting divorced. <laughs> and it was a big topic, okay? It was a big topic. Um, all of my heroes were, that I grew up with and that I idolized in photojournalism were pretty troubled on the family side and hard drinkers and it was a, they were a different generation. You know, I'm older, but um, when our son was born, I'm in my second marriage and luckily I married well. I have a, a lovely wife who has supported me through my career, has believed in me and put up with all of the craziness. But when my son was born, I realized I didn't want to be that guy, I wanted to somehow figure a way to be present and support my family as well. And uh, my wife's my partner in the business and helps me on that side. But um, that's one of the reasons I decided to do the commercial work because it allowed me to put my kid through school. It allowed me to pay for the health care we couldn't afford at the time and to fund my personal projects. There's a price for that. And I ended up missing a lot of stuff anyway. but. I've been thinking about that for years and years and trying to be more present and, and more there for my family. I think, I think it's important because as photojournalists, you probably aren't as complete a human being if you don't get married and have a relationship and learn what it's about. You won't be as empathetic to your subjects if you don't have children and go through life and all those struggles. It really does round you out if you go through that. And if you don't want to end up divorced, you have to give time to the, to the family. So it's just some, another thing to think about along with how are you going to build a business around your, your picture story, you know, or your hey, David, storytelling? We good? go all day, but I think we have to leave it there. All right. Oh, hey, yeah. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for your questions and for being here.